it's seven in the evening and I don't want to embark on a deep technical project. However, something has arrived in the post today. This, and this was a suggestion from Andy Beer, and it's something fantastic because when I was a kid, we used to always see these kinds of books in the library and they would really capture my imagination because of course I wanted to do stuff like build robots. And this is DIY robotics and sensors with the BBC microcomputer. Practical projects for control applications by John Billingsley. And look at that, lowercase j, lowercase b, very futuristic. And I have to say the uh, artwork on the front is a bit interesting because the robot does look a little bit like K9 from Doctor Who, but it, you know, it's trying, it's really trying to do some futuristic stuff there. Oh, damage. Should get some money back for that. How do you interface a homemade joystick, a stepper motor, or a fully fledged robot to your BBC computer? How do you write the software for stepper motor control? And how can you use the software and a few pennies worth of components to get an analog output? How can you build a cheap eye for robot vision? There's a lot of questions here, definitely a lot of how questions. Step-by-step -step instructions guide you in constructing a wealth of gadgetry. At the same time, you will build an understanding of the principles of digital and analog input and output. Hmm. Although he spent eight years as a Cambridge Don, John Billingsley, now capitalized, of course, because he's an academic, he's capitalized here, has a practical approach to engineering. His commercial designs range from autopilots and hospital computer systems to single chip cooker timers and a rising damp meter. He is a member of several IEEE committees, leads a team researching into robotics and is well known as the organizer of the Euromouse Maze Contest. Wow, well, I think John Billingsley would have been, or probably is, somebody I would love to know. I, of course, not from Cambridge, so I don't move in those circles. Let's have a look under the hood, because at least this is, this is our way of getting one step closer. So it was reprinted in 1984, and, oh, sorry, I'm just noticing my thumb is looking very grey there, a bit of filth. Uh, but original print, 1983, getting started. And look, I'm, mmm. It's obviously never been used this book before. Oh my gosh, there's quite a lot here. We're not going, to, I don't know, there's probably copyright and stuff, but you know. I'll just read the first little paragraph to you. As the proud possessor of a BBC microcomputer, you have more computing power at your disposal than served the whole of Cambridge University in 1957. You have no doubt played endless games, written programs of your own, and explored many of the mysteries of the machine itself. Now what? Well, actually, I am, I am interested to continue. You've got me enthralled. Until now, your machine has been dependent on keyed inputs for its performance, numbers on which to perform calculations or keystrokes to control games maneuvers. Why not now let it get its own data? Why not add muscle? Well, why not add a muscle or two in the form of motors and relays so that it can respond to the outside world? A new world of possibilities opens up, starting with turtles and robotics, ending only at the bounds of imagination. Oh, I tell you, this is some heady, heady stuff. I could just sit and read this right now, but we can't because we're looking through it. It's a kind of a, I don't know, show and tell of the book rather than a, a, a detailed um, treatise on it. So let's just see what it starts to cover. Basic equipment, control methods, power supply. Let's see what he's got. He's got a simple power supply here. I love this, it's telling you everything. Just get your transformer, bung it in. Chuck it on the mains with half an amp fuse. That's all you need, bish, bosh, bish. And you'll get two six volt outputs in AC and you're gonna bung them through your rectifier and that's gonna give you plus or minus seven volts. And you're going, why do I need minus seven volts? Well, maybe, just maybe there's some more amp circuits in here. And it's telling you the transformer is available from RS numbers 207-245 and the diode bridge number 262-113 so if you do go onto iris's website and type those in they'll probably still be there honestly you should just go do that and then let me know down below in the comments and here i can see it's telling you about the computer numbers being interpreted from 0 to 255 
or 0 to 65535, of course, whether you're using 8 bits or 16 bits. And if you're signed, it's minus 3,200,768 to plus 3,207, sorry, 3,000, 32,767. I oh, got that wrong. That would be a hell of a loss of bits if you did that bit of resolution. We've lost resolution, sir. Now, isn't this wonderful? The BBC, of course, like many computers of the day, had an analog uh, port on the back, and this is showing you all of that useful pinout. So let's see what we've got. We've got five volts and zero volts. Mm. Mm, I'm sorry, I'm going, okay. mm, because I'm wondering if I have some parallel uh, port things, because of pa the retro net, I don't know if that used the same amount of pins, but that would be damn useful to have that connector, because you can shove that straight in, you get your 5 volts, 0 volts, AG, mm hmm, we'll have to look up what, it says there, A.G, analog ground, probably an analog ground, yes, V reference, voltage reference, and then 1, 2, 3, 4 channels, of the digital input, as far as I am aware. PB0 and PB1 and L pen. Oh, I'll have to look through here to see what those actually mean. Not particularly well described. But it doesn't matter. We'll wire it all up. We're going to use it later. That's why That's why it's there in the book, isn't it, at the end of the day? Look, constructing a uh, joystick. So you're going to bung two potentiometers of 100 kilo ohms each. And let's see where they're going. So they're going to the analog ground and then that's your v-ref so that's the voltages coming out i would i wonder if that uh, is adjustable i'm surprised it's not just bung to five volts but i don't know that's why i'm not an expert should read the book and then of course you twiddle your pot and then your input is going into channel one and then your second pot is wired up the same ways for that and then it's good zoom in have a look why don't you see <laughs> see for yourself and then you can see its um, wiper on the uh, variable resistor is going to channel 2. So you're going, hmm, well I can see that these would give you X and Y axis, but X and Y axis potentiometers a joystick doth not make. Well, well look at that though. That is a simple joystick and you can make it with a couple of bits of bent tin. And look at that, he's bent that tin round there. He's got that pot is actually acting at the pivot point on one end, which is actually, if you open them up, look inside your Switch controller, or maybe not your Switch controller, but your, your Xbox controller for sure, um, you'll see this arrangement. That is more or less what it's got. It's just made out of plastic, made out a little bit of twiddly stuff, but that's that. Oh, a light pen, well. Light pens are actually pretty simple, and actually, oh, there you go, nice and simple to see. You've got a photo transistor. Let's just making sure I didn't miss a page. You have a photo transistor here, um, and that's going into a regular transistor. And you've got your five volts and your zero volts going via obviously a 10k resistor here, and then you're just going straight into the L pen input. I mean, that's crazy simple. Look at the basic program to just you know read it and do stuff with it. And I love this. Here comes the mumbo jumbo. Don't worry about what that means. That's basically what he's saying. Don't worry, it's just some uh, BBC micro uh, low level register pokery. You really don't need to know what it means because it just works. Just trust me. And then you can have your moving blob and Tim's music program. Tim, are you gonna do the music program? I know at least we have one Tim who watches and he might be interested in doing that. Now, um, graphics design with a joystick. Well, I'm just gonna skip it. Now, yeah, don't pause the screen and copy stuff off this. Just go and buy the book, honestly. Uh, my, it's not my intention to pirate this, this book, so I'm going to cover stuff. Look, you're not getting to see what that is. Oh, oh there's, a, there's a whole program there of drawing stuff with the joystick, which is cool. Right, back to the hardware. So this looks very much like a ribbon uh, cable connector. So ribbon cable, you've seen it. It looks like this, and I do have connectors somewhere. But they come in this groovy thing where... Basically, you put the wire into the connector there. You can see these have got little pins here. And then you push that first clip on and it pushes the ribbon into those metal contacts which bite through and uh, make contact with that. And then you fold it back on itself usually. And then you push this bit in which is the strain relief. It's absolutely blimmin' cleverly marvellous. And you can see here, this is describing the same things. It's pretty much um, an obvious thing, but so bloody useful. Make sure if you go online, go onto Alibaba or RS or Mauser or DigiQ, whoever you like, and just buy a whole selection of those. You can never have too much ribbon cable and too many um, of these in different uh, pitches, of course. Um, 
maybe get, get, I don't know, go and look inside your computer. Get the size that's for the IDE drive, that could be useful. You always, an IDE drive and a Raspberry Pi, there you go. So it's giving you some instructions on how to access this user port and you can see those are the instructions. Now, interestingly enough, the user port might not be accessible to you if you're using one of those user port SD um, card things um, that emulates a disk drive. So have a look around underneath in case you are, because this project might be somewhat now limited to you. You might have to stay on the analog end. Um, but you can see here, this is giving you a whole bunch of digital interface, uh, digital pins. And you can see, of course, that they do work quick enough and fast enough and can be used to access uh, SPY, the SPY bus on a micro SD card, um, which is cool. I'm not sure if that's in one bit mode. I think it probably is in one bit mode, which is just basically SPY. So yeah, you could probably interface to quite a lot of modern electronics with this. I'm talking about sensors and uh, gadgets and maybe talking to other microcontrollers. So that's cool. Switching mains voltage, look at this one. So they're using the digital output there it, directly with a solid state relay, which you can see is connected to the mains and then that's just connected straight to a lamp. So, I mean, that's an, that's pretty brave. But then, of course, this book's probably from the 80s where people were allowed to play with mains projects. And then there's your bit of code to turn it into your, your timer switch, which is pretty marvellous as well. Analog input for the Model A. So, hmm, why is the an Model A now? Why is the Model A so different? It does say here, Model A owners will now be impatient to know how to input a joystick signal without needing to add a fully fledged analog to digital converter. This method described here uses no more than a single bit of the user port. The roots of the technique lie deep in the depths of antiquity. They're at least five years old. Which, uh, by this reckoning, means they're at least, what, <laughs> 40 years old? <laughs> Oh, how it works. The old single chip TV tennis games needed to encode the joystick. So when you had the single chip TV tennis games, like was probably my original first console, uh, which was the grandstand one, you had a little twisty pot and you were playing variants of Pong. So it's all about um, how to play the variants of Pong. And you can see you have your variable resistor and it's going via a capacitor to PB0. Mm -mm -mm. And my guess is how they're they're working this. It's the when you adjust the resistor, it will change the rate uh, at which that capacitor will saturate and no longer draw current. So I suspect they're using that um, and some sort of time base thing to control that. Um, and I, 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 I'm not going to lie. I don't know how, we'd have to read this, but it's a, a, a simple way of making a, um, a uh, analog to digital converter um, using a resistor and a capacitor. It's, re it's really quite common. Um, I, I forget how it works, but I, I have also implemented these myself, but not using a pot, but you're wiring these things in. There you go, very interesting. Um, and I love that it's minimal pin count, right? Once you've made these headers and connected them to your user port and your analog input of your BBC uh, micro, you can literally just use them for all sorts of stuff and then just type in these, these programs and play with them. You don't really need to mess around with loads and loads of pins and wires and stuff. Ooh, what's this one? Is this something, uh, a gadget to mess with a compass? Yes, okay. It's probably to teach you how a motor works, really. So let's have a look to see what they're doing here. Oh, they are doing it. So what they've got here is, uh, so you've got a uh, transistor here, which is putting five volts through that uh, coil, but it's only putting five volts through that coil when the digital input is going high. And the reason it's going through a 1K resistor, of course, is you don't want your five volts going into this transistor. The transistor is probably gonna be saturated and switch at 0.8 volts. And that's what that will be doing, and that's gonna work great. And basically, if you see the diagram, it's gonna allow your BBC micro to mess with a compass. <laughs> you're jamming, we're gonna be, you're doing some proper hacking and you're hacking the uh, the compass. Please don't bring that on an aeroplane, they won't like that, it'll be weird, to be honest with you. Asking for a 240 volts hookup for your BBC Micro and your cub monitor, that's gonna be crazy beans. Right, so what they're doing is, it's, it's basically showing you some principles of stepper motors. So you're using the first uh, band, which is the previous example, to move the needle and it's gonna swing one way. And what they're doing here is, he's hooking up a second um, transistor. And that second transistor is to a second user port. And I think the idea is they're gonna 
tweak um, each port in turn. And because you've got two sets of windings, that needle's going to go dick, 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 dick. Well, I, I think it'll be quite quite jaggedy, but it'll be like moving from from here to here, to here to here. I'm, I'm spinning it. It could just be doing this as well. It might not necessarily be turning. But that's the principles of using a stepper because I think if we keep going, here you go. You can see now that you have a stepper motor here with a permanent magnet in the middle and a bunch of coils. And you see the A coil and the B coil. So that's two windings in this particular one. Um, in fact, this is just uh, yes, a four pole stepper. It tells you right there. <laughs> and um, through the um, process of twisting uh, these windings or powering these windings, it's going to twist that stepper motor like a printer. Go, did, 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 did. Very accurate, very good. And it needs a bit of juice. I'm not going to lie, it needs a bit of juice. So what they've done here, they're using a Darlington driver. So a Darlington um, transistor is basically a transistor that goes into another transistor to give it more, you know, give it more power. In fact, I have some here and uh, I can show you. Let's, let's do that. I'm going to show you in my box of stuff and it's like here, one of these. It's a, a tip one to one transistor and you can see it's beefy, right? They're beefy because these are power transistors. They can take a bit of the old current. And what they're showing you in the picture though is a package um, that looks like an integrated circuit, because it is, of um, several in one. So it's got at least four in here. So you can see it's nicely wired up with four. And conveniently then you only have to have one ground pin and one power pin because it's, it's all clever. And what they've done, do you remember that power supply? Of course you remember that power supply. Giving you the plus and minus seven volts that we saw earlier, they're actually using both of those. They're ignoring that zero reference. They're using, if you see here, I'm going to zoom in because it's so important. They're using the plus seven volts and the minus seven volts to give you a combined a combined potential of 14 volts so that's going to give your motor a big old push of voltage which they do need if you've got um, a cnc machine or your desktop equivalent which would be a 3d printer you've seen those things whee, moving around and if you look inside you'll see little black blobs of epoxy chips with heat sinks on them that look like well they don't look like this anymore really but you know what i mean they're that color <laughs> and that's got heat sink on it um and that's because they're gonna they're, they're sinking some juice put it that way and look there's your turtle um anybody's got a turtle will know what a turtle is but basically it's a little car with a pen shoved in the middle so you can use logo or you know um basic type programming to go go forward 10 go left one and then draw a picture of a pokemon that's basically what they're for we didn't really have pokemon back then but you get the idea and now he's building up he's saying look if you control one motor you can control like five motors or <laughs> something let's see one motor two motors three motors four four motors including the grabby the end effector as they're known in the trade and you can see here there's a, a bunch here. In fact, he's using, I'm saying, is he, by the way? You know, we, we, we did, we did um, figure out the, the the gender, the sex. I don't know this gentleman. Um, but you can see here that they're, they're using this hex inverter. And I think perhaps that's to get more um, outputs. Because um, as you can imagine, if you hook up this, this system, you're going to be able to hook up only so many um uh, stepper motors so my in fact or up to eight times six i think i my guess is this is to provide you the ability to choose which motor you want to power and then twiddle your darlingtons for that and then uh, don't don't um quote me on that though without reading it and really understanding it fully who knows um stringing to obtain parallel for our movement Ooh, this is groovy so you've seen these actually when you when you sometimes see these little robot things in schools and whatever and they have these these um, rubber belts between stuff and that's so that when they move like the the platform stays horizontal or whatever that's how they're doing it that's kind of cool whoa what's a gadfly that looks like very much like the 3d printers that i have here i have the any cubic cossel, if you Google those, they have um, three arms and that it moves the head using um, adjusting effectively the height of these arms in relation to the head and that will move it 
across the bed. So that is basically this. Look, from 40 years ago, you think you think we're using all these new fangled technologies, but it's not really, is it? It's all this, this stuff just made cheap enough that you can have it on your desk. We are literally living in the future, which is pretty amazing. So what else is going on? Phase advance. Oh, it's starting to get all very um, fancy. Motor drive, taco output, servo amplifier. <sighs> oh, I tell you what, I'm uh, I'm getting warm with excitement here. I have to mop my brow. Look at this. You could learn a lot from this book, honestly. Just think what it would be like if you had a BBC Micro back in the day, and you went down to Tandy, Radio Shack in the US, or Maplin. Uh, Maplin probably more likely, um, and pick up all of these bits. You could literally just work your way through this book that you've paid, um, I want to say £5.95 or six six pounds ninety five. here you go, um, for. And I don't know what £6.95 would have been in 1980. It would probably be at least £8 of today's money. <laughs> and you could just follow through this whole book. Robot Vision. Hang on, is the, how is the Robot Vision? Is it this? Connections of the eye. So let's see the eye. It's basically uh, looks like a photo diode. Well, it's saying photo transistor, whatever. Um, a ground and channel one. So it's, it's showing you a simplified diagram, of, like, I guess. No, uh, hang on. Is it photo? Whatever it is. And you can see here, as light um, changes in here, it's going to affect um, what channel one is detecting. Yeah, so channel one will be detecting an analog um, signal here. A bit unlike the light pen, which is really just looking for, you know, a very on off. This is this is this will give you a range of values. Um, Move down, move less. I don't know what it's trying to get you to look at. Or is it maybe using the eye to actuate the motors? I think it could be. And look, it's saying about robot intelligence. The definition of a robot can be broadened to embrace any machine which is a robotnik. I love that, Dr. Robotnik, which means a worker. It is not hard to include automatic washing machines and dishwashers, which, after all, measure such variables as water level and temperature and apply programmed control accordingly. Although a micro mouse does little work, it surely it is surely a robot. There you go. I missed that one. That's fine. Robot ping pong. We can't all be Cambridge dons at the end of the day. So look at that. There's a conclusion, and I love that. Shall we read the conclusion together? <clears throat> then, then you don't have to buy the book. I'm only joking, of course. Oh, robot ping pong. Oh. Microprocessors and robots may do all the pundits claim in establishing a new industrial revolution. Manufactured goods will probably continue to slide in price, and only a nation of Luddites would continue to rely on monotonous assembly line work as the basis of the national economy. You may be able to hasten the revolution a little, and it will be hard to delay it. But whatever economic significance robots may have, they are enormous fun. Hear, hear, Don John. Catch you later.